Good morning and welcome to City Center. It is our great joy to be worshiping God with you this morning, to praise his name and lift him high and gather as his people from the corners of our region together on this live stream Sunday morning worship service. If you're here for the first time, if you're watching for the first time, a special welcome to you. Thanks for coming to spend this hour of worship with us and we would love to get to know you better. In fact, if any of our congregation have a question, a prayer request, just wanna get in touch with our ministry team, we are working full time every day of the week and ready to serve you. So hit that connect button that's on your screen. It'll take you to a form that allows you to let us know. Maybe you wanna say, hey, I'm new, I just started watching. Or maybe there's something more that you need to communicate to us. We will get right back to you and would love to hear from you. There's a kids button just for kids on that same page, and it takes you to the programming content for our Kingdom Kids every Sunday from Miss Heidi. There is worship songs and some Bible study for their own time of worship. And our youth are meeting on Zoom every Sunday right after the main service at 11 a.m., and details can be found on our website. We would love for you to download our new church app. It's called Church Center. Uh, you can go to citycenter.today, and there's a link where you can get that app for your preferred device and platform. In there, you can find out everything that's happening. What's happening is the button you press, and it'll take you to all of our classes and courses and men's and ladies' Bible studies happening Wednesday for the men, Monday for the ladies, uh, class with Pastor Brad studying the book of First and Second Peter, small groups every night of the week. It's so important to be connected, especially during this time, and we have a whole range of things going on at City Center uh, to help with that. There's also a button on, that, on your page that says give, and that's to our online giving options or instructions for how to do that through physical means. We uh, encourage you, if you're just here for the first time or a couple of times, uh, this is not an obligation for you. It's part of our worship, and thank you for being so faithful in that regard. God is faithful. He is our rock, and we praise him. So I want to invite you to worship with us this morning. Whether you're in your living room or bedroom or kitchen or den, maybe you want to stand together with us. Maybe you want to clap your hands as we sing praise to the King of Kings. <laughs>
King of heaven, come now. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven,
can rely on you. I can rely on you. When my heart is overwhelmed, I will look to you alone. God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock. are faithful through it all. God, my rock, God, my rock, God, my rock, in the blessings and the pain. Through it all in day. can church family you can rely on him he will never fail you it's great to see you and yes I am seeing you by the eye of faith and I know you can see us and we want to just encourage you and challenge you uh, what a blessing this morning to have Bill playing our prelude and uh, you can't see it of course great to have Joey on the platform with us you can see him but the guy in the back on the guitar there, Paul, is supposed to be on holidays today, but he chose to come in and play the guitar anyway. That's faithfulness. I appreciate that so much. And uh, I want to just mention to you, church family, that if you can see more ways or better ways that we can serve you or the city that we serve as a church, then please uh, shoot me an email. Get in touch with us. Let us know any ideas that you have. 
uh, that you've seen or heard of that we can use in serving people, in strengthening the relationship that we have. Uh, in a not too distant future, we'll be sending out another uh, survey just to get some of your feedback. But I wanted to preempt that by saying, if you know of organizations that we can activate our people to support in helping our city, helping the poor in our city. I don't want us just to remain online. I want to find ways that we can get the hands and feet of Christ out into our world. So please do be in touch with me. Speaking of being in touch, please don't take this as a personal advertisement, but every week now I'm writing a blog and I want you to sign up. I'd like to have a 1,000 people signed up for the blog. That's my goal. I just consider it a three- to five-minute contact between my heart and you about various matters that are happening in the world, biblical issues that we're facing, and sometimes random ideas that I'm writing about. I'm not boasting at all about being an expert writer. I'm doing it because I want to stay connected with your heart. So you can sign up for my blog on the website and uh, start reading right away. And each week, you and I will have a three to five minute visit and uh, uh, stay connected uh, in love. As every Sunday, it seems, I'm so sorry to extend sympathy today to the Akinbami family on the loss of their father. Tunji, this past week, Tunji traveled to Nigeria for work and took ill. Uh, He's only 62 years of age, and so we extend our love to Tolu, his wife, and their children, and especially many of you will remember that their son, Chinedu, was a member of one of our last GO teams to Colombia. So remember to pray for the Akinbami family. Our missionary of the week are the Limmers in Japan. Remember them, hold them up before the Lord. They have also gone to videos online and they're asking us to pray that God would use them as a new form of outreach in their city in Japan. And now, as always, church family, whether we're together in person or separated like we are for a short time, It's my great privilege to pray with you and to pray for you. Would you join your heart with me and let me lead us to the throne of grace? And I thank you, Lord, that we have access to your very presence. We can come even, as your word says, boldly because we come in the name of Christ. We come in the righteousness of Christ and we come seeking your grace We need your help in our lives, Lord. We need the fresh touch of your Spirit upon us. And I pray for your people today. I pray for their walk of faith. I ask that you will strengthen your people, that they will be faithful during these hard times, and that they will even flourish in faith and grow in grace. Lord, I pray also for their witness before the world. This seems to me, Lord, to be an opportune time for the church to demonstrate the sufficiency of Christ, the compassion of Christ, and his saving power. So I pray that as we interact with our neighbors and friends and family online, I pray that we will be the witness that you've called us to be. And of course, Lord, I pray practically for each one's work I pray that their jobs will remain secure. And where they're not, I pray that there will be new levels of faith and you will lead your people. I know, Lord, there are numerous individuals in our church that are now unemployed. I ask that you will open doors of opportunity for them. And I pray that you would meet their every need as they trust you. With great blessing, I pray for every home And for every heart represented in our church family, come to our hearts, Lord Jesus. Dwell in our hearts by faith. Rule in our hearts. Transform us into your goal, which is to be like your son. I pray for everyone that is sick and sad and struggling. 
And I pray for straying believers. Oh God, bring back those who have wandered, especially during this difficult time in the world. And I pray boldly that you will deliver us from the evil one, just as you taught us to pray. I ask that you will set a hedge of protection around every believer and every believer's home. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, to see our true freedom in Christ. And may we live as those who have been redeemed by your amazing grace. And may we display Christ to the world in every opportunity that you give to us. And now I pray that you will bless gift and giver as we honor you in the bringing of these tithes and offerings. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
in what could be called Jesus' signature prayer, he finished the prayer by instructing us that we should pray that we would be delivered from the evil one. Jesus established at least two truths in telling us to pray for deliverance from the evil one. Number one, that evil does in fact exist. It's a real problem. And number two, we need to be delivered from evil. So today, I want to study a passage of God's word that shows you the answer to that prayer. And the answer to that prayer, of course, is that Jesus himself is the one who delivers us from evil. Jesus is the one who is the mighty deliverer who will always answer that prayer because he has secured the answer for that prayer that we can, in fact, be delivered from the evil one. My text this morning is from the gospel that we've been studying all fall Mark's Gospel in chapter 5. Will you come there with me in your Bibles? And we're going to study uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. And I'm simply entitling this text, Men, Monsters, and Miracles. You're going to meet some monsters in this text. And a miracle of deliverance that Jesus gave a man who was possessed by an evil spirit. In Mark chapter 5. Let me remind you that uh, I, I'm skipping over the story in the previous chapter about Jesus calming the storm only because I preached it two years ago as a one off message. So you can go back in our website and have a listen. But remember that Mark chapter 5, the story of the demoniac of Gadarene. Uh, follows a long night at sea when the disciples thought they were going to drown, and Jesus is sleeping in the boat, and they wake him up, asking him if he even cared. Do you even care that we are perishing? And he spoke to the winds and the waves, and immediately a great calm fell across the sea. Now, that's the background. Uh, when in the morning he, they come to the other side, Mark chapter 5 is a text. Let me read the first 20 verses for you. And with great confidence and pleasure, church family, I remind you, the reading of God's word is more important than anything I have to say about it or anything you think about it because this is the bread of life for your soul, the word of God. Mark chapter 5, they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. And no one, notice that, no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains. But he wrenched the chains apart and broke the shackles in pieces. Again, it's repeated for emphasis. No one... No human being had the strength to subdue him. Now watch the agony under which this man lived. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was out crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have we to do, excuse me, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most High God, promise me, I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Now watch this. Jesus had obviously been saying to the man upon his touchdown on the seashore, he was saying to him, come out, he was confronting the demon or demons, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. He knew his fate was the abyss of Revelation chapter 9, the eternal damnation of the bottomless pit. And so he tried to bargain with Jesus. Notice in verse 11, now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city 
and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were terrified. They were, to- they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus. It's the same word that is used to describe how the demons begged Jesus not to send them into the abyss. The people began to beg Jesus, please be gone. Leave us alone. Go out of our region. Go away. We want no more of this. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him like the disciples are. But he did not permit him, but said, go home. Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis, that is the ten cities that made up that area, He went back and started to proclaim how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. And well, they should have marveled. Let me jump right into the text. I want you to see number one, the man who lived in a grave, the man who lived in a grave with an evil spirit. I couldn't get beyond that simple description of this person that was suffering the great spiritual agony that he was. He's a man. That's the operative word in the text. It's the common Greek word, anthropos. It's a Greek word that refers to a person or to humankind, not just to a male gender, but all genders, male and female. He's talking about humankind here. And of course, as Christians, we derive our understanding of the nature of man from the New Testament, And the New Testament derives its understanding and teaching about the nature of man from the creation story. Not from philosophy, but from history. And of course, the Bible tells us that man was created body and soul. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says, God breathed into man the breath of life and he became, man is described as a living soul. He's a holistic being. Track with me, church family. The Greeks used to teach in their philosophy that man is material and immaterial, but the immaterial, the soul part of him, is corrupted and immoral. But not in the Christian view, man is a holistic being. We are body and soul. And they work together to make us the people that we are today. Man was created as Genesis says, in the image of God, because, listen to me now, this is the point, man was designed to live in communion with God. Man's true existence is in communion with God. The purpose of your life, your reason for being, is that in this life God has entrusted to you, the life that you now live in the flesh, You should live it in communion with him, in fellowship with God, and in friendship with God. Creation reminds us that man was made by God and for God to enjoy the great gifts of God in man's life. But of course, this story brings us to a chaotic moment. We're told that the man had an unclean spirit. As you know, The terrible chaos that resulted in the human race and in the human heart is because of man's sin. And because of our disobedience to God, we forfeited our friendship and communion with God and became the haunt of evil spirits, of evil itself. The dwelling place of God, the place where man was supposed to meet with God, has become a haunt of evil spirits. Notice the description of this man's agony. He lived in a graveyard. He lived an isolated, lonely, separate life. He was living death, as it were. He was enslaved. His true identity was lost. 
because the demons had enslaved him, have taken possession of his life, and man's help was vain. Human beings who tried to help, I thought at least good for them, they tried. Man does his best to address the awful condition of evil in the world, but lo and behold, it just seems to magnify. Why? Because man cannot deliver himself from the evil that has befallen the world as a result of sin and the tempter. And this story is meant to remind us of the dreaded condition of the human heart because of the torture of the evil one who is raging against God and against God's people. He's called the accuser of the brethren. I've always said, not, that, not because he uh, hates you, he does, but his ultimate motivation is to poke his finger in the eye of God, as it were. It's to rage at God. It's, it's to rail at God. And this man, of course, in Mark chapter 5, is an example of the hopelessness of man when he determines to try and deliver himself or deliver, deliver his fellow man. They tried, but they failed. He lived among the tombs. He was controlled by evil. No one could help him, and the text tells us he was tortured. Notice carefully how the passage describes this man's condition. Night and day, it was continual agony. It went on incessantly every day. The text describes him as crying out in agony, crying out in pain, crying out in rage, crying out in despair. So the text says he night and day cried out, but it goes one step further. He tried to do harm to himself. He, he was cutting himself. No doubt in an attempt to end his life. We've heard a lot about mental health concerns during the pandemic. I've even talked with a few that have struggled with thoughts of suicide. Let me just remind you that suicide is a desperate attempt to escape the tortured heart that many people have through depression and disappointment and despair, but suicide does not originate with God, but with the one who wants to destroy your life. That is the enemy. So this man was cutting himself. He was doing great harm to himself. This is the man who lived in a grave with an evil spirit. What a grotesque thought of a life that was meant to be lived for the glory of God, enjoying the pleasures of God and the gift of life, now being tortured and tormented by not just one, but by many evil spirits. Speaking of evil spirits, let me go to my second point. I want you to see the monsters who had to be evicted from this man's life. That's the purpose for which Jesus has come. It's to evict the God of this world from the control he has over our hearts. And lo and behold, he does it. People are not meant to live in graves, and demons are not meant to inhabit human hearts. But here's a story where that is literally happening. Please take careful note of the way that this man is portrayed. Most versions of the Bible, including the one that we use, the ES, English Standard Version, describe him as being demon-possessed. But the literal translation is agreed by scholars that the word simply means demonized. It, the word demonized in the New Testament refers to the varying degrees of oppression or uh, harassment that demons can bring into the life of a human being. Demonization is different than demon possession. And in this case, it's the worst possible demonization. 
We're told that this man was demonized. Here it is in in its extreme harassment and control of this man's life. The demon here is referred to, notice this carefully. Uh, The Bible says there was a man living in the tombs and he had an unclean spirit. It's a perfect description of a demon. They're unclean spirits. Because everywhere they go, they contaminate everything they touch. What is pure, they attempt to make impure. What is right, they attempt to make wrong. What is good, they attempt to pervert to bad. An unclean spirit, in many different ways, is simply a contaminating spirit. It's kind of muddying the pure waters of the soul of man, is the idea So an unclean spirit contaminates everything it touches. So human governments are formed and their noble purpose is to serve the constituents that they represent and serve the people. But evil spirits come along and corrupt governments. Corruption should be a deep concern to every citizen because it harms the people, but it is rooted in evil. Evil spirits corrupt, contaminate Every act of sexual immorality is rooted in the devil himself. You say, hold on, Derek, what about our flesh? The devil uses your flesh. You have a trinity of evil that you must fight. The world, the flesh, and the devil. But the devil is said to be the father of lies. He is a murderer from the beginning. And he perverts God's order in sexuality that marriage is between a man and a woman, and sex is to be reserved for marriage. But evil spirits corrupt God's purpose. Evil spirits are contaminating spirits. Evil spirits distort the way that we're supposed to think about what is good and right, about truth and error. So here you have a man who is meant to be a trophy of God's grace, now inhabited by an evil, contaminating, corrupting, polluting spirit. And we're told a great deal about demons in this passage. Just before I observe the description of demons in this passage, let me remind you that there are many Christians that dismiss the reality of a spiritual realm and particularly a spiritual war that is being waged in the heavenlies. But that is, a, that is an ignorant position rejecting the very teaching of the Word of God. Central to the life and ministry and teaching of Jesus was to cast out demons everywhere he went. He went so far as to teach us how to pray, and prayer is our best protection against the evil one, Jesus said. And you should pray regularly that you would be delivered from the evil one. You can be naive about it, you can deny it, or you can accept the Bible's teaching that the devil is a real being and he has a vast horde of minions who are aligned with him to destroy God's gifts in the world. Let me just show you how this passage describes the demons. They are individuals. Isn't it interesting that Jesus spoke to the demon and asked the demon what its name was? They are individual spirits or they are invisible spiritual entities. This perhaps is the most intimidating reality from this text, somehow these individual spiritual entities have the ability at times to interact with the physical realm. They can oppress the mind. They can harass the Christian. But in this case, we're told that they can interact They can step out of the spiritual realm into the physical realm. They're organized. We discover in this passage that they were a legion. A legion suggests organization. And there were many of them. There were a lot of them. They are articulate and intelligent. They are sinister, always. 
They are subversive. They want to undermine God's purpose. Many scholars, including William Lane Craig, suggest that the demon's use of the name of Jesus as the Most High God was an attempt, actually, to take authority over Jesus because the practice in the ancient world was when you pronounce the name of the God, you took authority over it. Whether that's true or not, we know that the enemy is subversive. Satan's role is to seduce us into resisting the mind and will and purpose of God. He is the evil tempter, as are his demons, who want to lead us to do our own thing, not the will of God. They're strong, quite strong. I know that the enlightened mind would reject this text as mere myth, speculation, and bizarre at that. But I've talked to people who have seen the evidence of this superhuman strength that comes from an individual who's been harassed and demonized and inhabited by a demon. They're strong, but the text says they're limited. I thought this was interesting. As you review this passage, you'll soon learn that these demons are knowledgeable about spiritual matters. What I mean by that is they know full well who Jesus is. And they know that Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. And one day he will reign over uh, uh, history and mankind's destiny. And they will be assigned the bottomless pit or the abyss in Revelation chapter 9. Demons are knowledgeable about spiritual matters including the deity of Jesus Christ, the nature of Jesus Christ, and his authority and power. And they know how to seduce the human heart. In some ways, this passage, I think, can be a distraction for us. What I mean is that it is in this, this demonization is in the extreme, and so we might be tempted to excuse ourselves as that has never happened to us and will never happen to us. However, the devil is still able to tempt, right? Peter, Peter told those ancient Christians, he's like a roaring lion. He's moving about the world, seeking whom he may devour. And we are to resist him firm in the faith. Paul told us that we are in a spiritual warfare. We're not battling with flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. But the average Christian doesn't give a second thought most days of the week to the reality of a spiritual warfare in which they are engaged. And if you are not considering that spiritual warfare, I want to suggest to you, you probably are on the losing side right now. The devil is seducing and lying to you and you're believing it. You need to put on the armor of God and stand protected in the authority and power of Jesus Christ. Because spiritual beings, these demons, are knowledgeable about spiritual matters. So here a text talks about a man and monsters. When I was a boy, I had three or four recurring nightmares. And every one of them involved monsters that were chasing me. Then I grew up and became a man and realized that the monsters are far worse than anything I dreamed about as a child. Because evil exists, and evil has to be confronted, and evil can only be overcome in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. And we can only be safe from the tormenting powers of evil that enter our lives through various means as we walk in friendship and fellowship with Jesus. That brings me to my third point, and it is the master who works the miracle. The master who ends up putting us in our right mind and sending us back home to restore the relationships that have been destroyed by the evil's presence in our lives. It became obvious to me as I studied this text, watch this carefully, Uh, Track with me, church family. Are you tracking with me? Wave at the screen. I might just feel it this morning. Watch this. So the disciples and Jesus have just been in a giant storm. And And Jesus has set sail for this very region of Galilee. It's the region known as the Decapolis. 
It's on the northeastern shore of the Sea of Galilee in what today is known as the town of Kersey. There are ancient ruins there. When you stand to take a picture of an ancient 5th century Byzantine church, you see about the only place in this region where there were, were caves that would be used as graves and where 2,000 pigs would run down the side of the mountain into the ocean. So Jesus led the disciples through a physical storm straight into a spiritual battle, a spiritual storm. By the way, Matthew's detail of this miracle says there were two men harassed by demons. The explanation is quite simple. Each of the writers focused on a different person for a different reason. Check that out. Look it up carefully. But here Jesus didn't avoid evil. He confronted it, which is what he always does. Jesus doesn't wink at sin and he doesn't ignore evil in our lives. He takes it head on. See, Jesus couldn't wait to step out of the boat. And the passage seems to be telling us that from the moment he stepped out of the boat, he began saying, come out of him, you unclean spirit. So Jesus was, was addressing the evil. Jesus was confronting the evil. That's exactly what he told his disciples in Matthew chapter 16. Remember that passage? Jesus took them up to uh, uh, Caesarea Philippi, where was what was considered the gates of hell. And he said to them, uh, I will build my church and the gates of hell. He probably motioned to the gates of hell in the outcropping where all the false gods were being worshipped. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And when he said, I will build my church, the posture of his words is that I will move against evil. Jesus doesn't sit back and wait for us to come to him for deliverance. He seeks us out. He's the seeker and savor of the souls of men. He got out of the boat looking for the trouble. Isn't that interesting? Most of us spend our lives trying to avoid trouble. Jesus looks for it and takes it on because he wants our hearts free to worship him. He wants us to experience his grace in our lives. He calls evil out preemptively in verse 8. I know I'm speculating here, but I, I'm speculating on the authority of this text. We're not told the origin of evil in this man's heart. That's consistent with the teaching of Jesus. You don't always have to worship the devil for him to have access in your life. You can unknowingly admit the presence of evil into your life. In John chapter 9, when he healed the blind man, he said to the disciples, neither his parents or he sinned, but that the works of God might be made manifest. So the posture of the Christian is that we are on the defensive and offensive, offensive toward evil. Jesus confronts, he chooses the man and the unclean region. The Decapolis was a fairly despised area by the Jews, and the presence of the herds of pigs would be evidence of it. But here is Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, going to a man whose soul was being tortured, whose body is being destroyed, to work a great miracle. And the miracle was that Jesus cleansed him of the unclean spirit. Jesus took authority over evil in his life, and he set the man free. You hear what I'm saying, church family? That's exactly what Jesus said he came to do. Do you remember he quoted Isaiah 61? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. This man was bound in a spiritual prison and only Jesus can open the door and set you free. 
Let me show you how we know that Jesus can set us free and make us whole. This man is described having met Jesus and received the authority of his word, coming into relationship with Jesus. What happened? The Bible says he was sitting there. That's, that's Mark. Mark describes as the townspeople came to view what had happened, there was the man sitting. Luke describes the man sitting at the feet of Jesus. How do you know that evil has been eradicated from your life? Because you have a hunger to sit in the presence of Jesus, to be alone with him. I love the second description. He's clothed. He's been naked. He's been exposed. I wondered as I read this passage if one of the disciples didn't take off his cloak and throw it around his shoulders, picturing the work of true discipleship. It is to aid others. It is to lead others to know who Jesus is and to see that they are covered by the righteousness of Christ and to meet their need wherever it exists. Church family, we don't just exist to preach and to teach and to make disciples. In making disciples, we need to care for the needs of the people who are all around us. I love the description of this man that he's in his right mind. Until meeting Jesus, he couldn't put two thoughts together coherently. He was irrational, disjointed, tortured in his mind, which often is the worst kind of torture. But here he is described being in his right mind. That's always God's goal, is to get you in your right mind. You know, of course, what a right mind is. It's the mind of Christ. It's to think God's thoughts after him. It's to make sure that you are renewing your mind with the truth of God's word so that you can understand it and live it for the glory of God. I happen to believe that the mind is the single greatest battlefield of the enemy. The devil will not end up controlling most of you in demon possession. But he does delight to keep you believing a lie because his lie is the fortress that will keep you bound in spiritual defeat. And God targets your mind. As soon as Jesus touches our lives, he frees our thinking. The God-awful, God-forsaken thoughts that have possessed us forever are finally and fully destroyed through the mind of Christ in the process of renewing our mind. Let me just show you. I'll move along. He was responsive and obedient. He went immediately to say to Jesus, hey, can I join your band of disciples? I want to follow you around the countryside, and I'll be one of your witnesses. And in this case, Jesus said, no, what I want for you is to go back, go back to your family and friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for you. Go and tell the, your family and friends about God's mercy. By the way, that's what a testimony is. Tell Jesus' story. The sickening shift in the church has become that our stories and our testimonies are more important than how much the Lord has done for us. A testimony is a witness of the mercy of God to your sin. It's not magnifying your story, but glorifying his story. Go home. Become a witness. Tell the world what he has done for you. Are you tracking with me, church family? Here's a man and some monsters who met Jesus and experienced a great miracle in his life. Let me just finish by showing you the mob. So here are these monsters that needed to be evicted. Now the mob evicts Jesus from their region. I think it's a far worse action than the demonized man. They'd been exposed to the ministry and miracles of Jesus, but they sent him away. That's today's church in a nutshell. We have access to the presence and power and ministry of Jesus, and we are stumbling along in spiritual ineffectiveness and powerlessness. 
We've been exposed to the word of God and the power of prayer and the filling of the Holy Spirit, but we can't help hardly one poor soul. This is the church in today's world. Jesus has worked his great grace among us, but we are bastions of brokenness, sitting together in misery and pain with no one being redeemed and and released from the power of the enemy. I have a theory about why they didn't like Jesus. Of course, he messed up their economy. He disrupted their lifestyle. They didn't appreciate that for sure. That's the height of hypocrisy, isn't it? To not be able to value the soul of man more than your money. To not love Jesus more than your lifestyle. To not be prepared to sacrifice the comforts that you've earned from your own business for the glory and sake of Jesus. That's what's happening in this passage. But my theory is that they were, un- they were so deeply unsettled because if Jesus could confront evil in its rawest extreme form, surely he will confront the evil hidden in my sophisticated heart. And we are afraid of being exposed for the evil that lurks in every human heart. You say, what are you saying, Derek? Paul said, in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful. My flesh is in rebellion to God and I can be led astray even though I belong to Jesus. And so he wants to set us free. Who would you choose? Or what are you choosing? Your lifestyle? Your money? Your comfort? Your ease? What you want? Or are you going to follow on the coattails of the one who disrupts, destroys evil, but in the end he sets men's souls free? That's the choice we have to make. Kent Hughes in his commentary in the Mark of Gospel finishes this passage in the following way. It's so much better than I could do. I want you to listen, church family. Perhaps this needs to go directly to your heart. You have descended so low in sin and the marks are so profound that you cannot believe you can be made whole. You may have been or are being demonized. As you read this commentary, you're saying, you are naive, Kent. You know nothing of the grip of evil upon me. You cannot feel my hopelessness. If you could, you would not speak so confidently. My answer is that I know Christ. I have experienced his healing power, and I have this testimony in his word. He can. He can do it. Are you deeply scarred? Do you have filthy habits? Perhaps a mouth that is totally out of control, that has said little clean in recent years. Perhaps you are dishonest at your way of life. Maybe your scar is sexual, heterosexual, or homosexual, and you feel you are beyond help. Not so. Jesus, who calmed the stormy seas, also calms the storm-tossed soul. He can do this with a word. I'm equally concerned about those of us who are more sophisticated in our spiritual bondage. Our souls no longer hear the word of God. Our hearts have become callous and hard, and we're not responding to him. Jesus is the one who came to give life, and he said, more abundant. He didn't just come to set you free from the enemy. He came to make you sing and dance and thrive and flourish as a human being withstanding all the pressures of the world, the flesh, and the devil, and living in complete victory through Christ. And so I urge you, church family, if there's one of you out there that is listening and you are being demonized, go to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Let him speak the word that will set your soul free. Reach out to me so that I can pray with you and pray for you. You need to be walking in freedom, but not just walking in freedom, church family. You need to walk in victory. You need to continue to serve him in the power of his Holy Spirit. Father, I ask you today to take this event from the life of our Lord Jesus 
and use it as a powerful call to the hearts of your people and those who've been listening that don't know you to see that you can set them free from the demons that harass them, from the flesh that defeats them, from the world that terrorizes them, because you have overcome the world. And greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. May your name be exalted in every life. May your spirit visit every home and heart and set your people free, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought. church family in evangelical churches, our last song is like our benediction, and that's a perfect benediction. You need to know who you are. You are a child of God. Yes, you are. Through Christ, you belong to him. My benediction is simple today, church family. May you walk in freedom, not fear. May you live in hope, not dread. 
And I think this is appropriate after the sermon I preach today. May you be protected from the evil one by living in relationship with the eternal one. Go in freedom, church family. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We love you.